Hi, everybody. Y'all ever seen owners of dogs that look like their dogs? I've always been fascinated by this idea that, like, people could look like their pet animals. Or, like, sometimes how older couples tend to look like one another. Hmm. In this video, we're going to talk about how Lewis addresses this idea of, of obsession and how you end up looking like uh, the person that you're obsessed with. So let's go into our text and let's look at page two. At the beginning, we're still in the queue, just like we were in lecture one. Um, but what we should notice here is that, first of all, our main character is focused on getting up, getting ahead in line. Again, we're not sure why he's so focused on getting ahead in line, and you'll need to hold that in your minds as we move forward in the text. Everybody's worried that there isn't going to be enough room. In fact, one of the characters in the first paragraph on this page says, we shall never all get in. And then they sell, they trade places for money, but then she ends up getting kicked out of line. Uh, it's a weird situation, and you're kind of like, why is there money here? We don't even know what kind of a world this is. And that will come into play in just a little bit whenever we talk to, uh, to a couple different characters when we get on the bus. But we're not going to get too far ahead of ourselves. Let's look at that section that I was telling you about uh, briefly, um, where the people look like one another. It's in, the, it's in the top of the first paragraph. A moment later, two young people in front of him also left us arm in arm. They were both so trousered, slender, giggly, and falsetto that I could be sure of the sex of neither. But it was clear that each for the moment preferred the other to the chance of a place in the bus. Why is this so important? Well, go back to what we just talked about from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This idea that when we prefer uh, our spouse to God, that's going to prevent us from actually ever getting to be in heaven. And we see that quite obviously here. The two people in the couple prefer one another so completely that they actually look like the other person and you can't distinguish one from the other. They're kind of like, um, yeah, two, two lumps, like two cancerous lumps that are fused together and you're not actually able to tell the difference between the two. And they're actually, just like a cancer, corruptive for the whole, for the whole unit, the couple. Um, let's uh, continue down in our text towards the end of that first paragraph. A growl went up from the queue as, as the bus came in sight, and the, as the driver came in sight. Looks as if he had a good time of it, eh? And then they keep going on about this bus driver. Why are they talking about him in such negative terms? Well, they think that he's just pleased with himself because he, in all of his golden splendor, is coming to them, these lowly people waiting in line. But, in fact, that's not the case, and we'll see that uh, come into fruition in the later parts of the text whenever we realize that the bus driver isn't just smirking about the fact that he's so much better than everybody else. It's the fact that he's actually taking real joy in the job that he's doing. He loves driving the bus. As confusing as this sounds, it's his favorite thing to do. He loves his particular position, his particular place in the great story that's going to unfold for us in the rest of the text. And these people that are in this space cannot comprehend how he could possibly have so much joy. And they think that it's actually him just being smug about him being better than everybody else. But again, we'll see that that isn't actually the truth. Let's now turn our attention to the second paragraph. My fellow passengers fall like hens to get on board, but what does the text say? By the time everybody gets in, the bus was only half full. So basically what Lewis, the author, is trying to tell us is that everybody in the whole line from the very beginning didn't even need to fight for a space. They all could have gotten in. Everybody could have gotten in. There was this false illusion that there was some kind of restriction on the number of people that could get on the bus. It was a false illusion that there wasn't enough space for everybody. How many times in our own lives do we think about there being some kind of a restriction on people getting to be in a certain space? Oh, if I give that particular kind of a person the right to vote, then my ability to vote isn't going to matter as much. Oh, wait, if we start giving out handouts to other people, then my money, my dollar is not going to mean as much, right? We can hear these things in our own culture repeated um, as if our ability to eat is going to be impeded by somebody else's ability to also eat, right? 
And we'll return to this in just a moment at the end of the page. So keep that in mind as well. The next paragraph, we're introduced to a new character who will be given a name at the beginning of chap chapter two, the tassel-headed poet. In this book, you never get anybody's actual name. That's very important until you get to the very end. But you don't get people's names of all of these different spirits. Okay, that's, that's important to note. In here, the poet, just like we had with the main character who's unnamed, uh, the poet is remarking on the things that are in the world. And he says, quote, they've got cinemas and fish and chip shops and advertisements and all the sorts of things that they want. Wait a second. What kind of a world is it? Well, it's the kind of world that we would expect if we're attentive to the scriptures. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 5, we see, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more, and on and on until... And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Well, again, like I've talked about several times in class, God, whenever he chooses to do something with the world at the end of time, doesn't just make a new thing that's completely different from all the things that we've been able to recognize. No, he takes all the things that we've always been able to recognize and he perfects them. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't throw away creation, he perfects it. Okay? And here, even in this space, we can see some of the remnants of culture. Fish and chip shops, which are like a hamburger joint for the United States, but this is taking place in a sort of anglicized world, an anglicized world, uh, because, again, C.S. Lewis is teaching in Oxford. So what we should take from this is that this space, even though it's spiritual, right, because we're seeing people getting punched and stabbed and all that kind of a thing, especially in the next few pages, uh, and they don't die, um, we're obviously in the place of the dead. Um, but the, the, the space where the dead are in still looks a lot like uh, where they were in, in on Earth. Okay, So that's important to know. Um, a little joke C.S. Lewis throws in there. The poet is trying to find all the stuff that he's written. And C.S. Lewis's character is like, I muttered something about not having my spectacles um, because he doesn't want to read the poetry. Anyway, I thought that was fun. I just wanted to remark on that to you guys. And then finally, just to sum up, uh, as the bus is taking off, they realize that everything is covered in this mist, that actually there's no space that they seem to be able to get away from this perpetual dread, this perpetual state of twilight, this perpetual state of rainy, nasty mist, right? And that's going to be important that characterizes uh, this entire space that Lewis has been in and that he's leaving. Stay tuned for our next lecture um, on the next page of the book. Again, thanks everybody for tuning in.